So this is one of the medical emergencies that I pray you never get to face in your lifetime. Let's talk about acute epiglottitis. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at acute epiglottitis. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to Zambia and Beyond, grab a piece of paper, and let's go. Remember when you talk about acute epiglottitis, this is simply an acute inflammation and edema of the epiglottis, the Eritonoids as well as the airy epiglottic folds. It's going to be this rapidly progressive bacterial infection of the epiglottis and the surrounding tissue and may suddenly lead to respiratory obstruction. There is intense swelling of the epiglottis, the airy epiglottic folds and the eritonoids that's often associated with septicemia. Supraglottitis includes epiglottitis as well as inflammational edema of the hypotharynx. This disorder is actually quite common in children aged 2 to 7 years with an equal incidence in both males and females, but all age groups can actually be affected. Previously, infections were often attributed to Haemophilus influenza type B, but because of the advent of antibiotics and the advent of the extended immunization program, this has actually become one of the rare causes of epiglottitis in children, though it does cause epiglottitis in adults. Certain other causes include Streptococcus pneumoniae, Staphylococcus aureus, non-typable Haemophilus influenza, Haemophilus parainfluenza, beta hemolytic Streptococci, Branhamella catarralis, Klebsiella pneumoniae, as well as Haemophilus influenza type B, most commonly in children that are unvaccinated and in adults. Now remember that these bacteria are going to be colonizing the nasopharynx, then they're going to spread locally and cause supraglottic cellulitis, which is often accompanied by marked inflammation of the epiglottis, the veluca, airy epiglottic folds, the eritonoids, and the laryngeal ventricles. If you have a Haemophilus influenza type B infection, this may actually spread hematogenously, and the inflamed supraglottic structures mechanically are going to obstruct the airflow, and they're going to increase the work of breathing and ultimately result in respiratory failure. Clearance of inflammatory secretions is also going to be impaired, and this may contribute to the respiratory obstruction. Clinical features often come about abruptly, and there's going to be this progressive airway obstruction without a prodrome, it's going to start off with a minor upper respiratory tract illness, which rapidly progresses within a few hours or so. Other features include high fever that can be a temperature above 40 degrees Celsius, a toxic appearance where there is either poor or absent eye contact, cyanosis, irritability, and inability to console the child or even to distract them. They may have muffled speech. That's often due to a sore throat with difficulties in speaking. They may have a quiet inspiratory strider. So the strider that we often see in epiglottitis is much softer than what we see in laryngeal tracheal bronchitis. Epiglottitis in children is characterized by the four Ds, dysphonia, where they have this muffled speech, often attributed to sore throat with difficulty in speaking. They may have dysphagia that's often attributed with difficulty swallowing, which we call odinophagia, drooling of saliva, and eventually dyspnea. Children may be found seated in the tripod position as depicted in this image on the right, where there is hyperextension of the neck, leaning forward with the mouth being opened, and changing this position is actually detrimental to the child and can actually exacerbate respiratory failure. Other clinical features include use of accessory muscles of respiration, tachypnea, market suprasteno, as well as subcostal recessions of the chest. This may progress to restlessness, pallor and cyanosis, coma and eventually death. And remember that this severe respiratory distress develops within minutes to hours and you may have complete air obstruction with respiratory arrest which may occur suddenly. Which is why it's very important that you must secure the airway in patients that have acute epiglottitis. Here's another picture of what is happening in a child that's actually having epiglottitis. As you can see, they're leaning forward, their mouth is open, their chin and their neck is extended, hyperextended, and we can see that the epiglottis is swollen and obstructing the airway over there. Clinical features in adults are pretty similar to children. They may have a sore throat, fever, dysphagia, drooling, and the symptoms usually take 
usually much longer, more than 24 hours to develop as opposed to those that we see in children that develop rather rapidly. This is owing to the fact that adults usually have a larger diameter of an airway as compared to children and so it's the airway obstruction is less common and less prominent as compared to children. There is no visible oropharyngeal inflammation in some cases. There may be severe throat pain with a normal appearing pharynx and this may raise their suspicion of epiglottitis in adults. A delay in diagnosis and treatment increases the risk of air obstruction as well as death in adults. Diagnosis is often made by cautious direct laryngoscopy. This is done through flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy where you're going to visualize the epiglottis. You're going to see it as a cherry red swollen epiglottis when the airway is established. Remember that this should ideally be done in the operating room where you have the most advanced airway interventions such that if this child goes into respiratory arrest, you can quickly intervene. And adults may actually safely undergo the, the flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy because their airway is much bigger. You should never at any moment attempt to lie the child down. You shouldn't examine the child's throat with a spatula or even perform any lateral x-ray because this can actually precipitate total airway obstruction and even death. Even to the point such that you mustn't sedate the child, you mustn't prick this child with needles because this may exacerbate the airway obstruction if you haven't yet secured the airway. Cultures from the supraglottic structures and blood can be taken to search for the causative organism. And according to our lab laboratory investigations, you may see a leukocytosis with the left shift. 90% of the patients are going to be having a positive blood culture if the epiglottitis is secondary to Haemophilus influenza type B. Remember we said it spreads hematogenously. And if you do a lateral x-ray of the neck, you may see a thumbprint sign. I will show you what this looks like. So here's an image of a thumbprint sign on the lateral soft tissue x-ray, which is demonstrating epiglottitis. As you can see here, this looks like a thumbprint where this arrow is pointing. On the right of the diagram, as you can see here, we have a patient that's being intubated and we can see the stiff uh, edematous epiglottis that's seen in the upper part of the photo. And then, then the vocal cords are visible just below uh, and distal to the epiglottis. Here's another picture of an enlarged epiglottis that's seen here as a thumbprint sign, which is characteristic of epiglottis and distension of the pharynx. And we should note that this epiglottis here is displaced posteriorly and it's actually quite thickened. You must differentiate this from a steeple sign, which we often see in croup, where we have the narrowing of the subglottic airway, and we can see this as a steeple of a church. So do not confuse this with epiglottitis. This is often seen in croup. Differential diagnosis includes croup, bacterial tracheitis, retropharyngeal abscess, airway uh, in the airway foreign body, and remember that the tripod stand can actually, or rather tripod position, may actually be seen in peritonsilla as well as retropharyngeal abscesses. The difference between epiglottitis and viral croup include the strider, which is much quieter in epiglottitis, louder in croup. The cough is not present in epiglottitis, but you may get a barking-like type of cough in viral croup. The voice is muffled in epiglottitis and hoarse in croup. There is dysphagia and drooling in epiglottitis. We don't see that in croup. The fever is often high in epiglottitis, while as in viral croup, it's often low to moderate, but in bacterial tracheitis, it may be high. Toxicity is often present in epiglottitis and is absent unless if a patient has tracheitis in viral croup. Then often patients with epiglottitis are in the tripod position where the neck is hyperextended and normal in the viral croup. Management, remember that this is a medical emergency that I wish and I pray that it never befalls any of you. And they often require hospital admission. A senior anesthetist, a pediatrician, an ENT surgeon must be summoned and treatment must be initiated without delay. And remember, because this is an emergency, you must always have a protocol to manage epiglottitis that often involves critical care team, the otolaryngo team, as well as the anesthesia and pediatricians. The child should be transferred directly to the intensive care unit or the anesthetic room and this must be accompanied by senior medical staff in cases of any respiratory obstruction that's going to be occurring. Do not sedate the child. So you must keep them as calm as possible. Oxygen therapy is indicated if they cyanosis but of course it may be a bit of a challenge using a face mask because children generally find those as irritating. Do not attempt to lay the child down so keep them in that sitting position because that's where they find the most comfort. Avoid causing any distress or examining the throat with a tongue depressor as this can actually trigger these laryngospasms and eventually cause respiratory arrest and that's how the child may die. 
In some cases, there may be an urgent tracheostomy that can be done if the intubation cannot be performed and the tracheal tube can usually be removed after 24 hours because you're out of the danger zone. So the management of the child with epiglottitis is often lying initially with air and breathing management where you have controlled nasal tracheal intubation, which should be performed by someone who's experienced in the job. And before you actually intubate, you minimize any stimulation by administering the uh, humidified oxygen by your hood or uh, next to a bowl of water or a wet towel. Remember, face masks are not well tolerated in children. And an endotracheal tube is usually required until the patient has been stabilized. That's about 24 to 48 hours. Usually, total intubation time is less than 60 hours for both children and adults. Alternatively, you can, if you can't intubate, you may perform a tracheotomy but this also requires some sort of expertise. If respiratory arrest actually does occur before an airway is actually established, you may perform bag mask ventilation and this can actually be a life-saving temporal measure. In adults who, whose airway is actually severely obstructed and they can actually undergo endotracheal intubation during the same flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy, other adults may actually not need the immediate intubation, but should be observed for any possible airway compromise in an ICU with an intubation set in a cricothyrotomy tray at the bedside in case this patient may need this procedure. Drugs that we often give include steroids, which can be given as dexamethasone 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per kg, repeated 8 hourly for a max of 2 to 3 days. This is helping with the reduction of inflammation. Gain venous access and send blood for labs and start on IV fluids. Cover them on antibiotic therapy. This is usually with the second or third generation intravenous cephalosporins for about five to seven days. So you may give them ceftriaxone, 80 to 100 milligrams per kg per day, intramuscular in two divided doses for five days, or cefotaxim, 100 to 150 milligrams per kg per day in two to four divided doses. You can actually even increase it up to 200 milligrams per kg per day daily in those patients that have severe infection. Ampicillin alternatively can be given IV at 200 milligrams per kg per day in three to four injections, and you should change this as quickly as possible to oral antibiotics such as amoxicillin, 100 milligrams per kg per day in two to three divided doses to complete the five day treatment course. Chloramphenicol can sometimes be used 50 to 100 milligrams per kg IV in four divided doses for five days and you can change this as soon as possible to oral treatment at the same dose for the remaining days. Do not forget to give paracetamol at 50 milligrams per kg QID or ibuprofen at 10 milligrams per kg TDS when the airway is actually secure and if the epiglottitis is secondary to Haemophilus influenza type B, rifampicin prophylaxis is actually indicated for those at home that are not immunized and the children that are younger than the age of four years with close contact. The prognosis is generally good with appropriate treatment and once you secure the airway, however, when treatment is not instituted, the patient will almost invariably die. Complications of epiglottitis include cellulitis, cervical adenitis, empyema, epiglottic abscesses, meningitis, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, respiratory failure, septic shock, hypoxia, prolonged ventilation, and death. I really hope you learned a lot about acute epiglottitis. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. To Zami and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.